I'll introduce myself really quickly. I'm Sanjit. I'm uh, the CEO and one of the three founders of Meraki. Uh, we've actually got the other two founders in the back as well, John and Hans, if you guys want to introduce yourselves really quick. My name's Hans. Uh, I run the product management team and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your guys' input on the product and, and your reaction. And my name is John Dickett. I'm uh, the CTO and I run the engineering team here. Uh, so I'm excited to hear the feedback you guys have. Cool. So uh, welcome to Meraki and welcome to San Francisco. Uh, I know we're the last show of the day, so hopefully you guys still have a little battery life left, but uh, we'll try to make it as interesting as possible. You got those, right? Five hours more. Um, so I've got a few slides here. I know uh, Slideware is, is not a lot of fun, so I thought we could just give you guys a little bit of background on the company, talk about kind of where we came from, how we build products, that sort of thing, and then go into the product. Um, so I'm going to kind of cover the first 20 minutes here. And then right around 5 o'clock, Pablo's going to take over and uh, kind of drive you guys through the actual product itself. And uh, something I want to mention, if you guys have any questions as I'm presenting, there's only about 15 or 20 slides total, so there's plenty of time for questions. Just kind of pop your hand up. We're going to try to watch this screen over here, and I think Richard is going to represent the Twitterverse in the back of the room. So for any of you guys uh, out in the streaming land, please do ask questions as well. All right. So let's get started. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with Meraki already? Uh, you know, about half? Okay. So what I thought we'd do is kind of cover a little bit of where did Meraki come from? What's our background? I guess you guys have probably seen we're a little bit of a different company. We're based in San Francisco. Our office is a little zany. There's beer everywhere. You might be wondering <laughs> what, what's the deal with these guys. So hopefully this will provide you some context, uh, and then we'll kind of move into the product side of things. Okay. So uh, the backstory behind Meraki is uh, we actually started out uh, in the kind of years before Meraki at MIT. So a bunch of us are grad students. Actually, myself and John were PhD students leading a research group. We worked on a project called MIT RoofNet, uh, which some of you may have heard of. It was around about 10 years ago. And as you might have guessed from the name, uh, the idea behind RoofNet was to build a rooftop network. Um, very creative name. So uh, we were really trying to investigate new ways of building networks, trying to figure out, is there a way to do it without big base stations, kind of the way the cell guys have done it? Uh, and can you kind of build an ad hoc network that could actually handle hundreds of users? Um, and uh, really, we're trying to figure out you know, what are the challenges that come up when you do that. And the idea here was to build everything. Uh, start with the radio. Uh, we actually built uh, everything up from the radio chipsets uh, all the way up to stack, all the firmware, all the management, all the routing protocols, the bit rate and modulation selection, all that stuff was in scope for us. So kind of a neat project. Um, and uh, since you guys are uh, RF geeks, I thought I'd kind of walk you guys through what a RoofNet kit looked like. Uh, on the right is actually the gear that we would ship out. And the idea was the network was going to cover Cambridge. So this is uh, MIT up to Harvard. It's about six square miles. So uh, there was an antenna that you see here. Uh, it's an 8 dBi Omni. It would sit up on the roof. It was on a mast. Uh, There's a 50-foot LMR 400 cable that you'd run down the side of the building. And uh, a little box here that was a, basically a PC running Linux and our own firmware on it. So uh, that handled everything from the routing protocols and the management, all that stuff. <coughs> And what we would do is, uh, the first couple of years, John and I actually would go around installing these things. We'd climb up a 40-foot ladder, uh, sometimes in the snow, which is probably a little dangerous now that I think about it. Um, <laughs> and 40 feet is about the height we're at. <laughs> it's a little scary. So we'd climb up, we'd install these, uh, these mast antennas, and that's how the network was coming up. And uh, on here, on the left, is this kind of screenshot of what the network looked like uh, about halfway through. So this is when we're about, I think, 40 or 50 nodes in. It got to about 150 nodes. It covered about six square miles, as I mentioned. Uh, and eventually, the network started to take on a life of its own, and it was really growing fast. So we put everything together in a kit, which is the box over here on the right. And uh, people would come over, come to our lab, pick up this kit, take it home, and install it on their own. And this ended up exposing a bunch of interesting problems. The first one was, you know, how do you make a network that can install itself and self-configure, right? We weren't going to go run around everyone's house, make sure all the installs were working OK. We had research to do. Uh, so we had to make the software smart enough to install itself. We also had to do a lot of mesh routing. Um, and we were building an outdoor network of very kind of um, uh, adverse environment, right? We had snow, we had rain, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we'd even see weird things like um, devices would go offline for eight hours at a time. And we couldn't figure out why that was happening. Uh, turns out we'd have students that would unplug the routers when they'd sleep, plug them back in, stuff like that, right? So <laughs> kind of crazy problems. Uh, but it was really interesting. And we spent a lot of time looking at the various layers, right? So we looked a lot at the RF layer, tried to figure out how are these links working, how are they delivering packets, what should the link metrics be, how should we design routing protocols, all that kind of good stuff. 
Um, and I thought I'd share a kind of interesting visualization. We're big on visualizations here, as you saw with the birds. Uh, so this is the graph that shows um, the quality of all the links in the network. And one of the kind of big insights from this research is we actually discovered that wireless links, everyone knew they were kind of lossy. We were measuring how lossy they were. And we found out that uh, it was very common to have links that would lose almost every other packet. So 50%, we'd have 70% links and all that stuff. And what was even more interesting is we'd see these links change over time. So this uh, kind of ghetto animated GIF that you see up here, uh, which is 2003 technology for you, <laughs> um, is showing you what the links would do over time, right? So this is actually a two hour slice of the network in the middle of 2003, some point, and you're looking in the middle of the night and you're seeing these links kind of go from 20% to 60% and back. So anyway, we'd start to see really interesting network phenomena. And as I mentioned, we basically had to make this thing self-configuring and self-healing, right? Because these networks were, uh, these links were coming up and down in the middle of the night. We had no control over it. We had students installing this stuff. Sometimes they'd misconfigure it, all that kind of stuff. Multiple gateways in the network, had to figure out how to load balance, all of that good stuff. And so it had to be really easy to deploy and manage. And this was really the kind of roots of Meraki. Um, so as I kind of go through the details of Meraki itself, keep this in the back of your mind. This is the context that we came from. So eventually, uh, we actually did do some research when we weren't running around installing antennas. And the research actually ended up doing pretty well. Um, so these are three of the papers that came out of the project. Uh, they ended up winning the top awards in the IEEE and ACM conferences. And you see the link measurement stuff. We came up with new routing protocols. Uh, and then we came up with uh, a bunch of other stuff, modulation selection. This is right around the time that uh, 11G was coming out, right? So 2003, uh, if you remember. And so a lot of interesting research problems and um, some cool stuff. So one of the things up here on the right, this is uh, something that John worked on. This was the rate selection, the modulation selection. Uh, we figured out that once you have all these bit rates, all these different things to select from, you need smart algorithms to tell you how to do it. Uh, John's algorithm actually ended up becoming one of the gold standards. And he will refuse to admit it, but uh, <laughs> it's actually one of the best ones out there and is now part of the standard Ethereos distribution. Uh, if you guys are running Linux on any of your boxes, compiling an Ethereos card, you'll see his driver in there. That's the kernel config uh, snapshot there. It's probably about 100 million devices running some of that code. So really exciting impact. And uh, we had one other side effect, which was uh, we ended up coming up with the basis for Meraki. And so this is around 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, the picture you see up there is a little board is basically running all the same software you saw that uh, kit running. So that $4,000 radio managed to condense it down to a single board. And this is what kind of gave birth to Meraki. Um, <clears throat> and if you're curious, uh, the way the company actually came about is we had no plans of starting a company. We weren't, uh, we were actually on track to become professors and kind of do the academic thing. Uh, I came out to California to give a talk about these papers that you see here on the left. I was at Google, um, my last slide was this picture and I said, you know, you guys like crazy ideas, this is our crazy idea. And there's a guy that came up uh, after the talk and said, that's awesome, I'll take a thousand. Um, and so, you know, every company has a kind of unusual starting story. So figuring out how to sell them a thousand routers was how Meraki got started. Um, and uh, this, by the way, is a Photoshopped image. This wasn't even a real board at the time. So they were just that excited about it. And I told them, I was like, hey, that's, it's, you know, it's Photoshop right now. They said, yeah, it's really exciting. How do we get a thousand of them? So this is what led to Meraki. Um, and since then, we've become a full-fledged networking company. So for those of you who followed us over the last couple of years, uh, you saw us, we started in <coughs> wireless. So, you know, the wireless field day folks, I think you guys are probably most interested in that. Um, started with BG, 11N came out, we adopted that. Uh, so released a bunch of 11N products, single, dual, triple radio, uh, indoor, outdoor. So all the kind of different shapes and sizes. And then last year, um, we made the move into the other parts of the network. So we actually got into branch routing and uh, security appliances. So this was the MX line, if you guys have been to our website. And uh, we've got all these products over here, and I think you guys did a quick tour of the third floor, so you probably saw some of them open down there as well. So uh, these are the security appliances. And then uh, most recently, just two weeks ago, we launched our switches. So we got into gigabit switches, 24, 48 port, POE, non-POE with 10 gig uplinks, really cool Ethernet switches. So now we've kind of got a full bag of networking products, at least for the edge. So this is what Meraki looks like today. And uh, we've kind of focused on all the different layers of the stack, right? So we've kept true to our roots. We've still got some great um, link layer stuff. We've got a lot of mesh routing. Uh, once we got into the security appliances, we started doing uh, traffic shaping and um, application traffic shaping, so at layer seven. 
Uh, and then as we moved up, we started to really think about the bigger problems. How do you manage these networks? How do you manage networks at scale? And so on. And so I kind of call this, you know, going up to layer eight, right? Which is what's the kind of bigger picture? And uh, we call this piece the dashboard. This is our management console that covers all of our products, whether it's wired or wireless, uh, doesn't matter to us. So network-wide visibility and control. So this kind of picture, I think, illustrates what we think about at Meraki. It's everything from the hardware and the firmware all the way up to the management system. So fully integrated. OK, um, any questions on that, the, just in terms of background? Make sense? OK. Um, so talking a little bit about our customers, right? Every company is really defined by the customers they serve and the problems they solve. So we've got customers of all different shapes and sizes. Uh, one of the unique things about our model is you see benefit from Meraki if you're deploying 10 access points or up to 10,000 access points, or maybe even more. Uh, so these are our customers uh, on a map. We've got customers in about 150 countries now, uh, including some really random ones. Uh, I didn't know there were islands out here, but it turns out there's multiple Samoas. Um, so we're, we're in the various Samoas, among others. Um, we've got lots of exciting logos now on our slides as well, as you guys will see. So in retail, we've got Starbucks uh, as a customer, we've got Burger King, uh, and education, MIT and Stanford are two landmarks. Um, there's some carriers on there, Telmex and British Telecom. Uh, and then some fun brands, Piggly Wiggly for any of you guys from the Midwest or the South. Um, and, and a bunch of other ones. So really all different shapes and sizes. And uh, you guys are probably seeing slides like this from every vendor, so I won't go through this very much. But <clears throat> we've got uh, customers in pretty much every vertical now as well. So um, let me fast forward here for a second and talk about the scalability aspect. And I think that's where Meraki starts to get interesting. Uh, so I know the word cloud is kind of a bad word. I've been following the Twitter stream here. Uh, so I'll try to avoid it, but there is something uh, kind of interesting about making something that scales really easily, right? So in the past, companies typically targeted a certain segment, right? They go after the very high end or the SMB. Um, but with various web services and cloud services, we've seen a new kind of company that targets a wide spectrum, right? So salesforce.com is a good instance. Gmail as a product is an interesting example, right? You can be an SMB using Gmail. You can be Genentech and be using Gmail, right? So that's kind of the similar story with Meraki. And I wanted to show you guys two case studies of what very large networks look like uh, with our technology. And we're going to dive into the demo. You'll actually see the product here in a second. Um, but we do have some customers with very, very large deployments with over a million users in them. So two examples here. Uh, one is Accor Hotels. They're the uh, holding company for the Motel 6 uh, and Super 8 chain. Um, not the most glamorous brand, but one of the very, very largest deployments out there. About 100,000 hotel rooms covered with Meraki, 10,000 APs. So they deployed that network in about five months with our gear. Uh, and then on the right is a map of Telmex. Um, have you guys heard of Telmex? Quick show of hands, maybe? So, okay, a couple of you guys. So Telmex is like the AT&T of Latin America. Carlos Slim, richest man in the world, this is his empire. Uh, and he's decided to, or someone on his staff decided to choose Meraki. Um, and through them, we're deployed in every Starbucks, every McDonald's, every <coughs> California pizza kitchen, every Chili's, uh, train stations, airports, you name it. So thousands of locations are going up every month with our gear. And uh, they see a lot of benefit from being able to deploy networks very, very quickly. So kind of big and small, right? All different shapes and sizes. So switching gears a little bit into the technology piece, uh, one of the questions we get a lot is, well, how is Meraki different? And, and really, how is it different for the customer? And so uh, you'll hear us talk a lot about the customer. We're a very customer-focused company. Uh, despite our very technical roots, we think ultimately you have to solve problems for people. Otherwise, you're not relevant. Um, so you know, we've got this uh, out-of-band architecture or cloud architecture. I think a lot of folks are talking about this stuff now. Uh, rather than talk about how we're different from them, I thought I'd just show you what we do and let you reach your own conclusions. Um, so this is a diagram of how our products work and how they fit into the network. Uh, obviously very simplified. So you see our three kinds of products down here. We've got our access points, the switches, and the uh, security appliances. You plug those in on-premise. Uh, could be in a headquarters, could be a branch office, doesn't matter. Uh, they connect directly to your uh, network connection. And all the traffic from the network actually goes just straight out to the local area network or the wide area network. So that's what you see with the red arrow here. Could be you know 10 megs of traffic, 100 megs of traffic, just goes straight out the pipe. What comes back to Meraki is this light blue line, which is the management data. And this is uh, over an encrypted, compressed uh, stream that comes back to us. It's a tunnel. It takes about a kilobit per second, so not a huge load on the network. Um, and this is what comes back to our data centers. And we run multiple data centers, and I'll show you that in a second as well. So 
with this architecture, it gives us a couple of uh, neat benefits. The first one is the scalability, which you saw. You want to deploy 10,000 APs. You basically just plug them in. As long as they can get to the internet, they can get back to our data centers. Um, and so that lets you es essentially have unlimited throughput, right? You can keep adding access points to multiple sites, keep scaling your capacity, keep scaling the number of users. Uh, you can add devices really easily. So they all provision from the cloud. They're basically all managed from the same interface. So you, you kind of claim them as part of your network. Uh, when they turn on, they, they figure out their profile is and start running it. And uh, we've got this real-time tunnel that I'll mention, uh, that I mentioned here. And this real-time tunnel gives us all the telemetry, right? So for those of you familiar with the Cisco nomenclature, it's kind of like CapWAP. It's a lot more compressed and a lot richer in terms of uh, how much data it funnels back and forth. Uh, the other cool part about this is it ends up being really reliable. So we've got multiple data centers powering these networks, and uh, that basically provides high availability. If one of our data centers goes down or there's a routing loop in the internet somewhere, you can still get back. Um, the the uh, devices can still uh, talk to some kind of data center at Meraki. And if for some reason your local connection gets cut, backhoe runs through the fiber, who knows what, um, the network continues to function. So that means you can still jump on the network auth over radius locally. Uh, you can still file share. You can still print. So what you lose is the management plane. In other words, you can't see the stats on the network for that instant in time. But the network keeps functioning. And then uh, finally, it's secure. Oh, question? Is that all functionality? Uh, all functionality in terms of? So if you lose the, you lose the management plane, or you, you lose the connection to yep. you know, whatever it is that's centralized. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are it, some of the sure. So if you look, if you host your own captive portal locally, you don't lose anything. If Meraki's hosting it, obviously you can't contact Meraki, uh, so you'd lose that. Um, in terms of basic LAN functionality or the LAN functionality, really, that's all there. What you lose is the ability to kind of make policy changes, right? So there's no local appliance that's doing that for you. What about a yeah, great question. So Sam had the question of automated control plane functionality. There's a lot of intelligence in the access point. So almost all of that, uh, we can go into the details later on if you want, but mesh routing, a bunch of the RF planning, the traffic shaping, um, the application control, all that's done in the access point. Yeah, so, so that keeps functioning. So you say you're controlless in that sense, that only management plane is upstream to internet? Yeah, you know, I, I think you could say that. Um, there's. It's just all kind of marketing buzzwords, so sure, it's, it's sure. really hard to tell what that means. But yeah, you could say we're controllerless or we're cloud controller or kind of. But basically, if, if the internet it's management plane. Cut, yeah. We can still authenticate. We can still roam. Right. Um, you still got you know, like Samlet, RM, some kind of cooperation going on between your APs. Yeah. So, a kind of interesting architecture, sort of similar to what you guys might have seen before. Uh, but again, these are the kind of customer benefits that we're focused on, right? Yeah. Question on that one kilobit per second. Uh -huh. uh, is that per device or is that? It's per device, okay. yeah. And it's about average. Uh, you know, you, you'll probably get some to go a little above, but it's like two kilobits per second. Uh, it is, uh, we can talk about the compression later, but it's uh, fully compressed. It's binary differential encoded, which means it doesn't, it's deduped, right, if you will. Uh, and it's transmitting a ton of information about applications, users, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, we got a storage guy, right? No. Um, <laughs> so kind of going behind uh, the curtains a little bit, talking about what is the cloud, what are our data centers, this is a kind of quick, high-level look. Uh, if, you, if you peel back the curtain, you'll see that it's not a big Sun server back there. It's actually just a bunch of Dell boxes, right? A bunch of 1U boxes. Uh, I see Jennifer taking a picture because it's that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is exciting to us. And so the way this works is we have multiple data centers. We've got one here in the Bay Area, one down in San Diego. Uh, one in Dallas, one in Virginia, one in London. And these all provide essentially uh, this high availability, right? Uh, as a device, we could be an access point. Uh, we plug in and they contact two different data centers, so a primary and a spare. These data centers are on different ISPs, different colos, different power, all that stuff. And those act as essentially the two primaries, right? So if, if one of them dies for whatever reason, a disk dies or uh, rack space goes offline, which it did last year for three days. Our customers aren't affected because their network traffic is also being handled by a second data center. And then we also have a backup. So Amazon S3 acts as encrypted kind of deep freeze, uh, which means that if all of our data centers were to go offline for some reason, we can recover all of that in less than a day. Um, so that's, that's the kind of data center side of things. The servers themselves aren't that impressive uh, in terms of number of CPUs, right? Eight or 16 cores, they're beefy. I've got 
uh, 16 or 32 gigs of RAM, a couple of one terabyte disks in a RAID configuration. Uh, but it's really the software that's, that's the magic, right? So we've got our own database software, the tunneling that we talked about, the UI, the tools, all of that is what we focus on at Meraki. Yeah, Andrew. Just a quick question around um, how you're doing the data center hosting for um, customers mm -hmm. as a managed service provider for the management stuff. Yeah. Um, like, how dynamic do you move those workloads around the data center? Or are they configured? Are they provisioned to hardware for a customer? Or how do you work that? Yeah, so it's like most multi-tenant services, like <coughs> a Salesforce. So we will move organizations around uh, based on load. Uh, it could be how much capacity the servers have. Uh, we're also coming out with new features, and I'll talk about just database load in a second. Um, so if we come out with a really burly new feature, we might split what we ca they ca uh, call these groups shards. We might split a shard into two and that kind of stuff. So we take care of that for you. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not the dangerous kind of shard. Um, and uh, we also do a lot of other stuff. Since we are a managed services provider, you're trusting us with a piece of your infrastructure. We run uh, daily intrusion tests by McAfee. Uh, we're SAS 70 certified in all of our data centers. We go through audits. We're actually PCI level one audited as a company. Uh, so you might have noticed all the cameras and all the various security measures. That's because Meraki itself has gone through a level one audit. Uh, so this is kind of the architectural diagram of how our data centers work. Um, and actually, I wanted to just pop in. I've never gone this long without doing a demo, so I want to do a quick demo. <laughs> um, but the cool part about the, the kind of hosted architecture is not just that we can manage the data for you, but we can start to do some really interesting things with the data and try to show you what's going on on the network. So Pablo is going to give you guys the full run through it. You know, you'll kind of go through it step by step. I just popped into uh, we, what we call the clients page, kind of an overview of what uh, is going on in the network. And we are looking at uh, Meraki Corp, so our corporate network's uh, clients page, and uh, at a kind of scale of one month. And so because we run these databases in the cloud, we can respond to queries very, very quickly. Um, and we can do some neat things about um, showing you what's on the network. So as I mentioned earlier, all of our access points do layer seven uh, application traffic control, right? So we profile uh, what applications are running on the network, not just uh, the host name, but we actually look at the traffic and figure out if it's Skype or encrypted BitTorrent or Salesforce or um, Google or whatever it is. So you can see Gmail and, and so on. We can show you um, all of this detail and uh, I'm not going to steal Pablo's thunder, so I'll hide that for a second. Um, but where the database gets interesting is you can start running queries. Like you can say, well, show me um, all the Apple devices, right? So you type Apple, it just filtered, showed you the 187 Apple devices, right? Um, you can say, well, show me Richard's computer, right? And uh, Richard's one of our product managers. Type Richard, it goes and filters that really quickly and shows that to us. Uh, we can even see. You know, this, this guy used 62 gigs of traffic, right? I moused over it, and you notice the little orange guy up top? So we can start showing you uh, the traffic for an individual device. And we're crunching all this stuff in real time in the back, right? Uh, yeah, question, you Tom. you use NetFlow to identify the protocols that you're seeing? It's, it's like NetFlow. It's not NetFlow. It's something we developed internally. It gives us a little more granularity. Uh, turns out some protocols like Skype and BitTorrent are, are all over the place, so you have to build a kind of higher level fingerprint. But it's it's same kind of concept, right? So, so it's, it's a little closer to because I speak Cisco. So okay. It's, it's like a, a PDLM for QoS. You you have to crack the header. On the back so we have to crack forward. the header, so it's all the way down to layer seven. Keep peeling the onion, and then uh, we we track flows and all that stuff okay. as well. Um, yeah, inbar. Yeah, inbar. Meraki based application, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we need to get some, yeah, some good acronyms going. Yeah, you right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I wanted to kind of show you guys this. You can also search by like device type, so you could type iPad. Uh, so all of that stuff's there. All this information is kind of at your fingertips. And uh, doing that for a single network is not, is not terribly difficult. You can probably figure out how to do it once you have all the information. Doing it for a lot of networks at once ends up being a pretty huge computational load. So at this instant, there's probably about 1,000 customers logged into our management console using the dashboard kind of doing queries like we were just doing. So we're sharing that infrastructure. We had to make that very, very fast. And um, you know, there's a lot of data going on here. So we were looking at a one month view there. Uh, so you see a month here. Each of those pixels actually represents about an hour in the month. So there's about 720 pixels on that graph. And uh, we've got all the different applications. So you can kind of see it for YouTube or see it for Skype. Um, and then we've got all those different users. So if you're thinking about this on the scale of a campus, or a, a large enterprise, you're talking about 10,000 users or a couple of thousand users at least 
and this ends up being a huge query load. So one of the things we ended up developing was our own database software because at first we actually just tried throwing this all into a big SQL database and you know, throwing a lot of RAM at it and seeing what happens. And it turns out it doesn't work so well. Uh, and here's an example, right? So this is uh, you know, a network with 3,000 devices on it. If you were to try to run that query where you're saying, well, I got 3,000 devices, each client runs about 10 applications, there's about 720 hours in a month, and each one of those data points is a disk seek in the worst case, that ends up being 17 hours of disk time, right? Which is a big, big deal. You can speed that up with RAID, but it's going to come down to a couple of hours, not a couple of seconds. Uh, you can throw SSDs at it, right? Spend a lot of money. Uh, we thought about that too. Um, still takes a long time. It takes about 42 minutes, even if you're getting these really fast responses back. So we ended up developing our own database that basically keeps this stuff in memory, uh, writes it to disk very carefully in a way that we can use the disk head to seek and uh, bring in lots of information at once. That's how we were answering those queries in under four seconds. In fact, usually under a second. Uh, so pretty interesting database technology. Uh, we can talk more about it later if you guys have questions. But we've got about 50 million client devices worth of information back in that database, about 10 billion active rows. So uh, a lot of scale in the database. And so this is why we develop kind of the whole stack. I, I kind of have a question for you. Sure. Um, the, the slide that you had previously, you were showing all the client data going out to the WAN, uh -huh. and really only some management data coming back to the data center. Right. How is it that you need such huge databases for just the, what should be fairly small data sets of management? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So really, it's, I think, a couple of different culprits there. It's management data. It's metadata. So we're not actually getting the traffic back, but we are looking at which applications are running, right? So for every device, every laptop, multiple applications over time, we actually stored a very fine-grained basis, so close to every minute. And so that's where it adds up. So lots of little bits of information, but it does add up very quickly. If you just do the math on you're getting uh, a few bytes per application per minute uh, per client. So you're actually seeing hitters back from the packets that are going out? Uh, summarized form of them. But yeah, that's, that's kind of the idea. So kind of like NetFlow in that sense. But great question. Uh, so, Andrew? Yeah, because I know there's been a lot of talk, and I, you know, I, there's a lot of banter back and forth in the industry on privacy concerns, especially around, you know, having that data be, be queried up and what access, you know, you as a managed service provider have access to for clients' data and their traffic. And so I think that's a, a pretty, you know, good point to maybe spend a, a minute talking about is mm -hmm. the privacy concerns that you guys get hammered with all the time and, and kind of what's your response to those, because I'd, I'd love to hear. Sure. Yeah, so we definitely have to take privacy incredibly seriously. We've got... Uh, we've got healthcare providers, right, and they have to comply with HIPAA. Uh, we've got sensitive traffic, law firms, all sorts of stuff. So uh, the short answer is we've got a pretty strict privacy policy. It's, it's up on our website. It's very clear and easy to understand. Uh, you can turn these features off, by the way. So if you think that this is kind of too much insight in the network and you don't want it going up in the cloud, you can turn off all the pie charts and all that reporting. Uh, and then we have a pretty carefully controlled list uh, inside the company of who is allowed access to this data. So, uh, for example, someone... Uh, like our, our receptionist can't just jump in and, and see what's going on uh, with all that information. So it's kind of those three different le levels. We can go more into it, but okay. it's one of the things we've had to do. Yeah, so like any managed services provider, we have to have that, that kind of control. Uh, so the other thing I want to talk about is when you're running this as a service, there's another benefit to our customers and our partners, and that is that we can develop new features and, and push them out very easily so people can get a hold of them. And uh, we call this feature velocity internally. Basically, that means you know, coming out with new features on a regular, consistent basis and very quickly. Uh, and we won't go through all of these either, but you know, everything from multi-site management to those pie charts uh, to NAC, we started offering that as well, uh, to content filtering, all the fingerprinting, all that stuff. We come out with these features every quarter, and we make them available. And they're no, ec no extra charge, right? It's a web service. It's kind of like getting better spam filtering in Gmail, right? So that's kind of the model we have in our heads. Uh, and this is really different. You're not buying upgrades, you're not buying firmware, none of that stuff. You can just kind of get your hands on it uh, and opt into it if you want. And uh, last couple of slides here. Our, our cloud is, um, is getting to be fairly large in terms of its capacity, right? So we've got about 10 billion rows of information, as I mentioned. Uh, we haven't always had that kind of scale. And you know, two different reasons. One, we've been selling more and more networks, and so of course we have more data to manage. Um, but two is we've been adding more richness into the product, right? So the traffic shaping and traffic control we just talked about, 
Uh, that, for example, about 10x the amount of data we had to manage because all of a sudden it's not enough to know that a MacBook transferred two megabytes of traffic. It's like, well, what were those two megabytes? Was it, uh, was it Google? Was it Skype? What was it? Um, so every year we've kind of managed to keep up this 10xing. And we started out with about 100,000 rows of information, went to a million, and then you know, 10x every year adds up pretty quickly. So we went from 1 million to 10 billion rows just in about five years. So uh, pretty interesting progression there. So I've got a question. Yes. You guys seem to be very, you concentrate on the network flows. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any plans for integrating with OpenFlow in the future? Uh, we're, we track OpenFlow. A lot of our kind of colleagues from the academic world went and defined that standard. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're keeping an eye on it. It's still pretty early. Uh, okay. So, you know, we're, we're kind of plugged in, but we don't implement OpenFlow today. So you want it to be a little more mature before you start looking at the... the yeah, basically, it's, it's getting into the first products right now. Right. Yep. And that's, we're also hearing a lot more about OpenFlow in the data center. We're very edge focused and access network focused. Uh, and so we try to implement a lot of that functionality with what we have today. Very good. Yeah, great question. Okay, so uh, just two more quick slides. Um, We've got a couple of different corporate philosophies, and you guys have gotten a sense of Meraki's corporate environment is probably a little different. Uh, we try to be very open, very casual, um, and, and really what we try to do is get a lot of customer interaction because we've discovered over the years that our customers and our partners guide us down the right paths, so we don't have to come up with five-year architectural roadmaps. If we can be nimble and be responsive, uh, that lets us kind of implement the most relevant features. And as, honestly, a smaller company, that's very important to us because we don't have the resources to throw billions of dollars at a problem. So we've got a couple of different ways of doing that. Um, and this, of course, isn't technology. It's not really an algorithm, but it is very, very important. Um, the first one is uh, what you see up here in the top left corner. So that dashboard interface, the web interface I was just using, every page has this little uh, one-liner in the bottom right-hand corner that says, I wish this page would. And you can make a wish. So that basically means you can type in a one-line piece of feedback, and it goes directly back to our engineers. So it passes or you know, gets CC to all the product managers, the marketing people. I see the wishes as well. But it actually goes to the engineer who built that feature. And <laughs> you'd be surprised how much bacon we've gotten asked for. <laughs> Donuts, bacon, pancakes, waffles, right? Money. Um, but we've gotten about 10,000 of these wishes over the years. And these wishes have really helped guide our product development. We've granted about 3,000 of these wishes. So we're in the wish business, in a, in a sense. Uh, but it's made it really easy to work with our customers to develop new features. So we can get feedback very, very quickly. We can deploy features to 0.1% of our customers or people that opt into it. So a lot of the stuff that you guys see us announcing this year, we've been working on for 18 months or, or nine months with our customers getting their input. So very short feedback loop. We also do a lot of stuff in person. So we'll actually fly out our customers, um, bring them out to Napa, put them up in a nice hotel for two days, and then spend two days in this room just getting intensive feedback, saying, well, what do you like and what do you not like about the product? How can we improve? And we try to do that as often as possible. And I think that's really one of the reasons we've gotten to this point, uh, is just getting that input from our customers. Uh, and then you know, along those lines, we focus on the overall customer experience. We discovered pretty early that it wasn't enough to have a faster AP or one that had a cooler routing algorithm or whatever it was. People wanted problem solved. Um, so along the lines of that feedback, how do we provide a great overall customer experience? And uh, it turns out this kind of has three stages, right? The first one is the pre-sales stage. When you're learning about Meraki for the first time or trying to figure out what it is that we do, how can we make that as good of an experience as possible? So we spent a lot of time uh, on the website just making sure the information's out there, it's plain English marketing. We try to avoid jargon as much as possible. And then we do lots and lots of free trials. So you've probably seen this little button on our site, free trial or live demo. You can get your hands on our gear very easily. In fact, we encourage it. So um, that's something we do day in and day out. There's uh, dozens of trials going out on a regular basis. Uh, and then we also focus on the installation piece. So let's say you decide to check out Meraki, maybe do a free trial. How can we make that installation as seamless and as uh, straightforward as possible? And uh, to do that, tons of usability tests. Uh, we bring people in that have never heard of Meraki, never seen our product, and, and watch them install it for the first time with no instructions, just to see you know, where do they get stuck. And uh, really interesting uh, phenomenon, right? We discovered that a lot of the kind of industry norms of you know, having a separate mount kit, for example, don't make a lot of sense to someone who's never installed a Meraki AP or uh, an AP before. Uh, so we started doing things like sticking the mount kit in the box, right? We started labeling all the little baggies the screws come in. Little things like that make a big, big difference in terms of how usable a product is. Um, and, and then the third piece is uh, what we call post-sales. So 
<laughs> this is uh, our support organization. And as you guys know, pretty much uh, everyone that installs a network at some point needs to call TAC or needs to call support. And we try to do um, wh whatever we can to deliver a high quality support experience. So we base our support out of our offices. Um, you guys might have passed them on the third floor. Um, they're, they're the guys with the crazy unicorn behind them. Uh, so that's, that's our Euro, uh, US support, we've got European support. <laughs> What's that? So there's a unicorn downstairs and I missed it? Yeah, there, there's also one back there on the board. <laughs> there's Easter eggs everywhere. Um, <laughs> it's magical, right? It's a magical place. Um, we also offer a lifetime warranty on all of our products, just so people have the peace of mind that if something happens, uh, Meraki will replace it, and we even offer advanced replacement. So if you say, hey, I need this thing tomorrow, we've got an event coming up, we'll FedEx you or UPS you an access point, uh, or a switch or a, or, or a security appliance. We also do automatic updates, as I mentioned, with those features, right? So how can we kind of go above and beyond, deliver just an amazing product experience uh, that goes just beyond the technology itself? So you do automatic updates to your devices. Is it a push from your central office? Do I have the option to defer an update? Absolutely. So you tell us when you want the update. Uh, if you're a retailer, for example, and you say, you know what, anytime Q4 is bad, uh, you can you can do that, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> After September, we touch nothing. Yeah, it, we we hear that a lot. So uh, we have facilities for for managing all that stuff. You can actually do that from the dashboard. And then uh, last slide here, uh, the company is actually doing really well. So I'm not going to go into detailed numbers since we're private, uh, but we've been experiencing some amazing growth over the last few years. So we've uh, from our inception doubled our revenue every year. And the last year, we actually uh, tripled our revenue. We've got no debt on the books. Uh, we're cash flow positive, so the company's doing great. Uh, we're investing a ton in, in our outbound efforts, right? So we've got a growing sales team. Andrew? What happened in Q1 2011? <laughs> <laughs> Q1 2011? Oh, why was it down? <laughs> it's really what happened in Q4 2010. We had an awesome deal. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but really, I think in terms of exponential growth. Um, I'm, I'm glad someone's watching the graphs, though. Uh, so we are hiring throughout the US and, uh, and throughout Europe as well. We've got a ton of outbound marketing efforts. Uh, one of the things we hear a lot is, hey, this is a really interesting product. Never heard of it before. Uh, and a lot of that's just getting out there. And we've got new products as well. Like you see over here on the, the right, we've got security appliances, the switches, and a very broad range. So we've gone from uh, essentially smaller networks to, to very, very large networks. And uh, of course, uh, to support all of that, we are hiring. So I know. Uh, I'm guessing, at least on the streaming cast, there's a lot of competitors watching this. Uh, Meraki's hiring. Uh, so, <laughs> so we've got, uh, <laughs> so you know, we will hire about 150 people in the next 50 weeks. So we spend uh, a lot of time just building up the talent pool here. There are 62 people watching. So Great. I can't guarantee so how many of them are uh, job seekers, but. Uh, well, maybe they'll tell their friends. Um, so with that, uh, kind of ready to go to live demo. Before that, though, any questions I can answer? Hopefully I wasn't talking too fast, but okay, good. Uh, sure. <laughs> All right, uh, Pablo, you want to come up? Great. Thank you, Sanjit. Yep.